Great wild places are becoming harder and harder to find. When you find two parks that are the epitome of wilderness, you have a treasure. Then, when you have the chance to see giant wild cattle, elephants, deer, leopards, and a myriad of beautiful birds, you have a wildlife paradise that can only be found in southern India at Nagarholi and Bandapur National Parks, the southern paradise of India. Nagarholi and Bandapur National Parks are found in the Karnataka state of southern India. The easiest way to get to these parks is to fly into the mega city of Bangalore. Bangalore Airport is not only an international airport in its own right, but has multiple flights a day from other gateway airports like Delhi and Mumbai. From Bangalore, it is an easy five-hour drive. The roads are good and traffic, though heavy in Bangalore itself, thins out as you head south. You may want to add a stop in Mysore. This city is famous for its incredible palace and monuments. Of the parks, we'll start our visit at Nagarholi. It's time to head to the safari, and just as our rule is, we're going to film this just like a safari. No special tricks, no special effects. In Nagarholi, we are using the Kabini Lodge, owned and run by the state of Karnataka. Yes, you heard me right, a state-run lodge. This is one of the few lodges owned and run by a government entity in India that I can recommend without a second thought. Most government-owned park facilities are very rustic, and these are comparable to private lodges. In fact, most of the western-level accommodations elsewhere in and around the parks are private upscale lodges. In almost all cases, the lodges provide in-park tours and safaris, and that is no exception here. The vehicles are first class, as are the guides. From the lodge, it is a short drive to enter the game viewing area of the park. Nagarholi is about 220 square miles, making it large enough not only to support deer, but also the biggest of India's mega herbivores, the Asian elephant. The first creatures we come across are two of the most common in central and southern Indian wildlife parks, the spotted deer or chittle and the langur monkey. One thing that I've learned over the years on safari is to never pass a good photo op, even of the most common species, because they may be plentiful here, but once you get home, their picture will be the one that you're missing. Now we won't hesitate though to leave a common group of animals like these when a radio call comes in that a rare creature has been spotted. And I don't mean that as a play on words, since the animal that the call came in on was a leopard. Many safari vehicles are equipped with a radio for safety and for sharing information on game viewing. So when the driver says to prepare to move suddenly after a radio call, you know you're on the track of something good. But then there is that one in a million chance of something popping by, or should I say running by in route. In this case, a sloth bear. Sure, that was just a split second of film, but that was more than most ever see. We will search in that area tomorrow morning, hoping for a better view. Now, I almost forgot with seeing the slot bear, what the mad dash was all about. Uh, oh yes, a leopard. It's a mom in a tree with her cubs. It's hard to see them. Now you can see them, or, or at least her tail. Seeing the leopard is a sign of a good tracker. Having the patience to wait to get the perfect picture or see some interesting behavior is the sign of a great wildlife observer. By waiting a few minutes, we get to see them descend from the tree and vanish in the bush. The lifeblood of the park is the Kabini River. It provides a year-round water supply that the leopards, sloth bears, and chittle need. It also keeps the park green, allowing enormous numbers of large animals to thrive. It is one of those big animals, the largest member of the bovine or cow family that wanders our way. The gar, weighing in at a whopping one and a half tons with a height of up to six feet at the shoulders is one of the forest giants. Often mistakenly called the Indian bison, though they are not, 
related to true bisons of the North America variety, which those are often mistakenly called buffalo, which the real buffalo actually can be found in India, but more to the north, well, we'll cover all that later. Now, what we were, oh yes, the gar. The gar is found in mixed forests of deciduous or flat leaf trees and scrub, but can also survive in grasslands. They are found in scattered populations throughout the Indian subcontinent. But one of the best places to see them is here in the state of Karnataka. The males are deep black, while the females and young are dark brown. They all have the characteristic white stockings. These are relatively docile animals with few documented attacks on people, though I have seen aggressive behavior when young are present. Their calmness allows for some good photo opportunities when these elusive animals can be located. Gar are generally found in herds of five to 20 individuals dominated by a single bull. They, like their domesticated kin, are herbivores, grazers for the most part. They have few predators. The young can be taken by leopards or dole, but only a tiger can take an adult. Even then, there are several reported cases of tigers being driven off or even killed in the encounter. The adults are highly protective of the young and will surround it when predators are detected. Gar are closely related to domestic cattle and can interbreed with them to form a reproductive hybrid. These hybrid, the mython, is the state animal of Arnantakal Pradesh, where it is the symbol of wealth. Agar can live up to 30 years in the wild. Populations outside India are endangered. India, with the largest wild population, has about 20,000 individuals, but that number is declining. Without adequate protection, these giants of the cow family may disappear due to habitat loss, disease from cattle, and poaching. Giant creatures aren't the only animals you could encounter in Nagarholi. One of the great finds in the park is the small, but powerful mongoose. These mini carnivores are a thing of legend in India. Rudyard Kipling told the story of a people-friendly mongoose, Ricky Tikki Tabby, that saved the human family he lived with by killing a deadly cobra. Though mongoose do not protect humans as a rule, they do eat snakes, including poisonous ones. They also eat other reptiles and small mammals. They tend to live underground in pairs where they will cooperatively hunt. They are very bold and often live near human settlements. There are several species of mongoose found in India, but all are small dynamos ranging from a foot to a foot and a half long and one and a half to eight pounds in weight. Falling somewhere between a mongoose and a gar in size is the wild boar, who, like the gar, is a close relative to one of our domesticated animals, the pig. The wild boar can weigh over 200 pounds and reach nearly six feet long. They are one of the more commonly seen animals being found in most wildlife parks, except in the high mountains and the dry desert. They often travel in large family groups, which, here is your special trivia for the day, is called a sounder. It wasn't long after leaving the wild boar that we see the first signs of one of the main reasons we visited Nagarholi National Park wild Asian elephants. The smashed bamboo could only have been done by the largest animal in India. Second in size only to its African cousin, the Asian elephant can weigh in at over three and a half tons with a shoulder height of an astonishing 10 feet or, put it in people terms, two men standing on each other's shoulders. These mammoth-sized beasts are close by and luckily in the open for easy observation. Nagarholi is one of the best places to see wild elephants. In fact, they are the prize animal for most safari goers. Unfortunately, there are fewer Asian elephants in the wild than in captivity. Only about 25,000 wild Asian elephants exist, mostly in the extreme south and west of India. Elephants are a flagship species. That means they become the face for conservation in a given area. If you save enough land for elephants, you save enough for all other species as well. When an ecosystem is healthy, the number of animals should be stable. That is not necessarily the case with elephants. 
Combine their slow gestation period, 22 months long. Think of mom carrying a baby for that long, especially when they weigh 200 pounds at birth. With the fact that it takes two more years to wean the youngster, and you have a slow reproductive animal. Uncontrolled poaching makes that slow reproduction even more alarming. Poaching is still a big problem. While we were filming, several elephants in another Indian park were killed by poachers. What do the illegal hunters want with elephants? Their tusks, which are actually only a modified upper incisor tooth. Only males have tusks in Asian elephants, while both males and females have them in Africa. Weirdly, the only other ivory teeth in the world are from a totally unrelated animal living in the Arctic the walrus. With our afternoon drive drawing to a close, we can be quite happy with our results. The close encounters with two local forest giants, the gar and the Asian elephant, along with the fleeting but exciting look at the rare and elusive sloth bear and the always hard to find leopard will make this drive one that I will remember for a long time. Remember, one of my golden rules of safari, never quit looking until you're parked back at your lodge. It pays off once again here as we get a last look at one of the most beautiful birds in the world, the peacock. There is nothing more important after a long and rewarding safari than a comfortable lodge. Kabini Lodge, run by the state of Karnataka, has several room types to choose from. I stated the tented rooms, which have all the conveniences, like toilet, shower, 24-hour lights, with the ambience of safari. Sometimes you just want to feel like you're somewhere special. And other times, you want to feel more like at home. That's what the Mahara rooms are for. They have the look and feel of a Western hotel. These hotel-style rooms will make anyone comfortable and have hosted celebrities like Goldie Hawn. No matter which style of room you choose, all meals and the game drives are included. All of this is due to the efforts of one man, John Wakefield, known affectionately as Papa. I was fortunate to have a chance to meet Papa and learn a bit of his story before his passing. He was a hunter in the vein of Jim Corbett, the famous hunter of man-eating tigers, a soldier, an officer, and the man who put his personal stamp on virtually all aspects of this lodge and park. Without fail, after each safari, he asked the driver and the guides what wildlife was seen. Even though he's gone, his legacy lives on in the park. After good night's sleep, we wanted to get our hands on the pulse of the park and find the two big game animals we had fleeting glances of the afternoon before the elusive sloth bear, and the hard-to-see leopard. It didn't take long before we were rewarded with a sloth bear's pug or paw print. We weren't just lucky to find the pug, though that plays a part in it, because we returned to the area where we had seen the bear running the day before. Sloth bears are more active at night, so wild sightings are rare. Couple that with the fact that they had been hunted, primarily to get cubs to train to dance in the streets for tourists, and you have an animal that doesn't want to be seen. We had this one chance to get the bear on camera again. We needed the luck portion to kick in if we would have any chance at all. This wasn't going to be easy. In all our previous drives, in all other parks, we had one bear sighting. Then, just as we were beginning to lose hope, a pair of bears appear at the forest edge. Unfortunately, they see us as soon as we see them, and they run back in. We didn't get much of a look and even less camera time, but it was only my third bear sighting ever, so it was still very exciting. In the movies or most TV wildlife shows, the next thing we would see would be the leopards. But in the real world, it's not that easy. The next animal we actually see is a bird. The woolly neck stork is an attractive member of that famous baby delivery service. They primarily eat small animals like frogs, snakes, and fish. Storks, though, are not alone in filling that niche. Herons and egrets have similar feeding habits 
and often feed in the same area. Grays are one of the larger heron members, very similar in size and build to our own great blue. Both groups rely on stealth to catch their next meal as opposed to raptors that are more speed and surprise. India literally has pages in the bird guides devoted to birds of prey. Raptors, as these birds of prey are also known, make their living full out as carnivores. They are the tigers and leopards of the bird world. Each has a particular prey that they specialize in, from snakes to small mammals to fish or even other birds. Some are even large enough to take a young deer or antelope. Birders will find more than enough species to add to their life list, with over 200 species identified in the park so far. One of the most sought after sightings is the India pita. A rare and colorful bird, the India pita's diet is primarily insects. Birds are great, don't get me wrong, but we had two big game animals in mind when we came out this morning, the sloth bear and the leopard. We saw the sloth bear even if for a brief moment, but the leopard remained elusive. But then our first clue presented itself, a pug. Maybe like the sloth bear, the print would lead us to the leopards. Something is moving ahead. This could be it. The animal is, it is, a sandbar deer. Oh well, sandbar are cool. They are the largest member of the deer family in India. Males can reach nearly five feet at the shoulders. These forest dwellers major predators are doles or Asiatic wild dogs and the tiger. Of the four species of forest deer in India, this is the only one not on the endangered species list. They are widespread, numbering over 100,000 individuals. Now that said, their numbers are declining and parks like Nagarholi may be their last refuge. Our next new wildlife encounter was again not a leopard, but one of the feathered kind. This is our third farm-related animal found in Nagarholi. We had already seen the gar, the cousin of the domestic cow, and the wild pig. Now we get a glimpse of the jungle fowl, the ancestor of our domestic chicken. The wild variety is a bit smaller, faster, and smarter than its barnyard cousin. This allows it to live in the same forest as wild cats, dogs, mongoose, and eagles. Ahead we could see smoke, and where there's smoke, well, you get the picture. The park staff was doing a controlled burn a necessary conservation tool for many national parks. Controlled burns get rid of old, dead growth and allow for new forage. It also helps prevent massive, uncontrolled fires from destroying a forest. Fire has been a part of the natural cycle well before man. While it is helpful to the forest, I feared it would drive the leopards away. But it wasn't 10 minutes down the road and we get the second sign of a leopard's presence. A warning call from a deer. We knew something was happening. Suddenly a bolt from the bushes across the road. A deer. The leopard can't be far behind. And then there were leopards. Yes, I said leopards. Three of them. To find one leopard on safari is super success. But to find multiple leopards two days in a row is beyond belief especially since these were not yesterday's mom and cub. These are three adults. Normally leopards are solitary nocturnal creatures. Why then would three leopards be out, so visible in the daytime? The reason is the oldest in the book, mating. The ranger said two of the leopards were females and they were following the male. What a lucky guy. Male leopards though are poor fathers. Leaving the female after mating is completed to attempt to sow his oats, so to speak, elsewhere. No child support, not even a birthday card. Leopards are one of the most common and widespread of the big cats, ranging throughout Africa and Asia. In India, they are found throughout the peninsula, with the exception of deserts and the highest mountains of the Himalayas. There are probably 20,000 leopards in India. That's seven times as many as tigers. This big cat, and I mean big, weighs in at over 150 pounds and reaches lengths of six feet. They are often found living at the edges of cities and villages. 
sort of the coyote of the old world. But that brings them into conflict with man, making them more dangerous than tigers. Their primary prey is deer and wild pig, as well as smaller critters like rodents and reptiles. They even take dogs and cattle when necessary. They coexist with a much bigger tiger by carrying their kill up a tree and living at the edge of the tiger's territory. The leopards added a special level of excitement on this safari, but you should never forget the experience of just being on safari. One of the things that people forget to do is to just stop and listen to all the sounds of the jungle, the birds, the monkeys. It's just remarkable. Not every safari has to find a leopard or a sloth bear to make it successful. Cherish the small wonders, the birds, deer, even the insects. They are all part of the fabric that make up the Indian jungle. The one thing I've learned about travel and safari is don't take it too serious. Sure, you want to see as much wildlife as possible, but you need to relax and have some fun. There was one of those purely fun items I wanted to try before leaving Nagarholi. I wanted to ride in a Karioli boat. This was an ancient boat style, handmade using local plant materials. They aren't fast, but they are sturdy and quite safe. Oh yeah, I found another use for them. When you're not using the coracle as a boat, there can be an alternative use. You can use it as an umbrella. I really didn't want to leave Nagarholi. In a short period of time, we had seen so much. It is truly one of the great parks of India, if not the world. But our next destination and adventure awaited us. River, we're in Nagarholi National Park. But if we cross the river, we'll be in Bandipur National Park, where we're going next. Bandipur National Park abuts Nagarholi, separated only by the Kabini River. Just an easy drive for Kambini Lodge, Bandapur offers a chance to see the wildlife of southern India. Upon our arrival at our lodge, the Bandapur Safari Lodge, also owned and run by the state of Karnataka, we took the opportunity to tour the grounds. This is a modern lodge located just minutes from the entrance to Bandapur. What makes this lodge so unique, not counting the fact that the rooms are very modern with all the comforts of home, is that they are named for the animals you could see in the park, like the tiger, or the elephant, or the sandbar. Every time I venture into a national park, I am filled with both a sense of excitement and wonder. Even parks I have visited many times surprise me as the wildlife, plants, and even the landscape changes. Our first encounter of the day is one of those incredible experiences. This tree, called the Flame of the Forest, is in full bloom and has attracted a myriad of birds. Plum-headed and ring-necked parakeets, sunbirds, flame-back woodpeckers, minas. It is a bird watcher's dream. This is just what I meant by parks surprising you. Each season, heck, each week, can give you the sense of a completely different park. A little further down the road, we get to an Indian gooseberry tree. It was all decked out in its fruit, another one of those changes you find in the park. Okay, these are Indian gooseberries, and they, they grow wild out here, and they say they're sweet, so let me give it a try. Mmm, not sweet, sour. Bandapur has the same type of wildlife as Nagarholi. You visit both parks to increase your odds of seeing the big game and to take in each park's unique scene. Bandapur didn't disappoint as we soon saw our first elephants. Along with Nagarholi, Bandapur is the place to see the endangered wild Asiatic elephant. Wildlife though can be a bit harder to spot in Bandapur because of the uncontrolled growth of the lantana. This obnoxious plant is not native to the park but was wrongly introduced and without natural controls, has taken over. The park is searching for ways to control it, but the mistake is hard to undo. Bandapur, as well as Nagarholi, is designated, along with a handful of other parks, as a tiger reserve. And yet, 
we had seen no signs of a tiger. But our luck seemed to be changing as we spot a tiger pug. We got really lucky in Nagarholi seeing both the sloth bear and the leopards soon after we saw their pugs. Could we go three for three? Soon we find another sign of the tiger, the remains of a sandbar deer. Sandbar are one of the tiger's favorite. Sandbar's major defense from a tiger is early detection, flight, and camouflage. The brown coat quickly fades into the forest where the sandbar prefers to dwell. This time of year is particularly good for the tiger since the chittle or spotted deer fawn. The deer have their fawns in a narrow time frame to help assure that some will survive. Predators can only eat so much, guaranteeing some will reach maturity. Not all the interesting wildlife is big. One of the smaller ones is the Malabar giant squirrel. Yes, it is a giant in the squirrel world, reaching two feet long, not counting their two foot tail. Another tree dweller is the Langur monkey, whose antics can entertain for hours. Sometimes you just have to sit back and observe animals just being themselves. Safaris aren't just about how many creatures you can check off a list, but the quality of the sightings as well. Bandapur is susceptible to poaching as is any park. Still looking for the tiger, our driver spots some movement. As we get close, we realize it isn't a tiger or even a deer. It's humans, and these humans are poachers. Our guide and driver give chase. We could see that they weren't big game poachers with rifles, but locals gathering fruits, herbs, and small game through snare traps, all of which is illegal. I went into the bush to see if I could find any evidence of what they were after, and if there were any traps, to dismantle them. All three of us came up empty. The poachers got away, and I found no traps. This once again, though, showed another way ecotourism can help by putting more eyes in the park. We had a good day at the park, even some unexpected excitement, but our luck with the tiger didn't hold out. Though reflecting a little with the guy, driver, and myself being out of the vehicle dealing with the poachers, maybe not seeing a tiger was good after all. On our way back to camp, we decided to make two quick stops. The first, at a local village that has found at least a partial solution to the lantana problem. A group of local men began to make furniture out of it. Chairs, benches, side tables, you name it, all could be made out of lantana. The local villagers here have found a way to take an invasive weed that is destroying Banapur National Park and turn it into a profitable experience. Our second and last stop was less educational and more pure fun. We got to help feed the park's patrol elephants. Several parks in India use elephants to get into the back country where poachers can't be seen by tourists. This was a fun and exciting way to end our adventure in Bandapur. This week we found wild Asian elephants in the bamboo forest and had an opportunity to feed their domesticated relatives. We saw how the introduction of non-native lantana has disrupted one park and how local villagers attempt to cash in on the uncontrolled growth. Finally, we watched three leopards play a once-in-a-lifetime moment that still leaves us breathless.